presentation, as you can see, I think as well as I, is on venom allergy diagnosis and treatment, sort of a very pragmatic topic within our field. And uh, Shannon Brown with what I still call Hollis or Steer. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there's jubilant in front of it. Maybe you can explain that. Obviously you were bought by somebody or merged with somebody. Um, but one of our main suppliers of immunotherapy, diagnostics and treatment is gonna give us uh, this presentation. So go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Altman. And hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I, I'm happy to uh, be here today to talk to you about venom allergy, and I will address uh, Dr. Altman's question about Hollister steer versus uh, jubilant Hollister steer, and we'll do that in regard to my disclosures. Um, I am a full-time employee of jubilant Hollister steer. Um, Hollister steer was uh, purchased by a large Indian company 12 years or so ago, don't quote me on that details, um, called Jubilant. And so the Jubilant umbrella owns a uh, Hollister Steer. Um, because we have such a legacy with the Hollister Steer name, we have retained that. And so um, absolutely refer to us that way. Uh, we, we still hold on to our roots uh, in, in that regard. So so that is my disclaimer. I have been with the company almost 17 years uh, in a very small R&D group. We do some work just for general characterization as our extracts. And I also work with the manufacturing department quite a bit uh, for process improvements. As you can imagine, a lot of our processes date back several decades. And so there's always room for continuous improvement. And so uh, with that, we will get started. I think everybody is on mute, but just wanted to throw that reminder out. If you do have questions throughout, uh, feel free to jump in and speak up and I'll try and answer them. Um, in real time, or you can save them for the end and I can touch base with everybody then. So, so what are we gonna do today? Um, hopefully I can impart some understanding of venom allergy in terms of diagnostic practice and patient selection, in terms of um, the current immunotherapy practices, and also give you some insight in how these venom products are manufactured. And to do that, I'll present on uh, six main topics. We'll start with some statistics on venom allergy. Uh, then we can talk about some characteristics of these stinging insects that are in question. Uh, we'll move on to diagnostics and immunotherapy practices uh, before we go into again, how the venom products are made. If we have time, I just wanna to touch on the very end about how we can uh, generate better awareness of this tr treatment option uh, for uh, stinging insect uh, hypersensitivity. So we'll get right into it. Um, in the United States, it's estimated that about 16 million people are living with a potentially life-threatening allergy to insect stings. And of those people who experience a systemic reaction to insect sting, somewhere between 30 and 65% will have an anaphylactic reaction if stung again. Um, unfortunately, severe anaphylactic reactions from insect stings account for about 60 deaths each year, and that estimate ranges anywhere from 40 to 100, and these are preventable, and that's what we hope to do um, when we treat patients with immunotherapy. Uh, it's estimated that there are over 220,000 visits to the emergency department each year because, for treatment of insect stings. Um, some estimates uh, even go higher than that. And the number of visits uh, tends to be increasing. Uh, one multi-centered study showed that 31% of patients visiting the emergency department uh, for treatment had an anaphylactic reaction, but only 20% were referred to an allergist. Um, so again, that goes to the awareness. Uh, the more awareness uh, we have of the treatment options, maybe we can get more people helped. Um, and, and there's cost uh, associated with this. There's cost of paramedic services. There's cost uh, emergency department admittance, inpatient care even, um, and just a general um, strain on those who are allergic. Uh, their quality of life can be compromised uh, by the fact, by fear um, and anticipation of being stung again. Let's uh, take a look at uh, what insects we're talking about. So. Essentially, all insects that are responsible for causing insect sting reactions uh, belong to the order Hymenoptera. Uh, collectively, this includes the bees, the vespids, and ants. 
Uh, Vespid is a term used to specifically describe the wasps, the hornets, and the yellow jackets. And there are five uh, genus of stinging insects that are responsible for uh, the most severe allergic reactions. And they're listed here um, in this table by both uh, their genus name and their common, uh, common name or conventional name. Uh, honeybees of the genus Apis. Uh, the genus Polistes are the paper wasps. Uh, Dolicho vespula are the hornets. The vespula are called yellow jackets here in the United States. Uh, they're typically called wasp uh, in Europe. And finally, the fire ants of the genus Solenopsis. And hopefully I didn't butcher uh, those names. So in general, allergies to stinging insects uh, can develop over time as a result of a, a repeated exposure. Adults tend to have more serious reactions um, um, than a, a younger population. Um, the honeybee, um, shown here, uh, can be one of the easier the hymenopter insects to recognize at first. They tend to be hairy or fuzzy, and they have a distinct appearance. Um, they're found both domesticated or in wild hives, and in general, honeybees are not typically aggressive. Uh, this is a picture of um, the, the barbed stinger that are on honeybees. After, the, after they sting, the stinger uh, with the venom sac attached is usually uh, left in the skin or can be, and the bee flies off and then dies. That's in most cases, of course, in nature, there are always exceptions. Um, they're not usually aggressive, like I said, but stings can occur when someone interrupts the bee um, in their flight path, or if you strike a flower where the bee is working. Um, and they're not to be confused with the bumblebee. Um, bumblebee bodies, can look similar to honeybees. However, they have more hair. Uh, they're usually larger in girth and the tip of their abdomen is rounded. Uh, their wings are usually darker in color and their stingers are smooth, not barbed. Um, so they can sting multiple times. Uh, they're generally uh, peaceful. Um, they don't typically bother people unless their nests are disturbed. And as there are no approved diagnostic or therapeutic extracts for bumblebee, uh, we won't cover bumblebee in this presentation any farther, but I just wanted to show you a nice picture of them. So on the other hand, it can be fairly hard to distinguish between the vespid insects, the yellow jackets, the wasps, and the hornets, um, and even for entomologists um, who are familiar uh, with insects. Uh, the vespid insects typically have a sharp, smooth stinger, again, not barbed, um, and they can also sing multiple times. Another uh, distinguishing feature is that hornets and wasps have a thin waist between the thorax and the abdomen. So if you've ever heard that physical trait called wasp waisted, this is where that comes from. And this distinguishes them really from the bee family, which has a thicker waist between the thorax and the abdomen. But you have to get up pretty close uh, to be able to uh, look at these uh, detailed features. Uh, this is an example of a Polistes exclamans, and this is the common paper wasp. Wasps are also rarely aggressive, uh, but they may sting if provoked. Uh, they build uh, hanging papery honeycomb nests that have open cells that can be seen from the underside. This is a picture of the Dolicha vespula ariania. Arianria, um, and it's commonly called the yellow hornet or sometimes the aerial yellow jacket. And it too builds hanging nests uh, that resembles a Chinese lantern. But yellow hornets are extremely aggressive um, as opposed to um, some of the others. This is another example of a hornet. This is the white faced or sometimes called the bald faced hornet. Um, and in, again, it's noticeably different in appearance from some of the previous uh, ones that we've looked at. This shows an example of a typical hornet's nest, which can range in size from a couple inches to up to 10 inches or larger. Um, Vespula, uh, like this Eastern yellow jacket, um, typically build papery nests, but located underground. And these insects are extremely aggressive. So if you're stung at a picnic where there's food exposed, or if you are stung from something coming out of the ground, there's a pretty high probability that the culprit uh, was a yellow jacket. 
And um, I don't know about in the Seattle area, but certainly uh, around here, they're very uh, abundant in the summertime. Uh, the red and black imported fire ants um, are also part of the Hymenoptera order. Um, their stings can be very painful and result in, in the formation of a white pustule within about 24 hours. However, because they're primarily, primarily found in the south and the southeastern parts of the United States, uh, we're not going to include fire ants uh, in our discussion today. Okay, now that we've become a little bit acquainted to these offending insects. Um, Gannon, can I stop you and ask you a question? I never yep. thought about this before, but mm -hmm. um, what's the reason that all of these insects have stingers? We're thinking about them in the context of causing human disease. What, yeah. what's, uh, what, what's the purpose of their having venom and stingers? What are they protecting themselves from? Well, probably my guess, I'm not an entomologist, but probably just any predator. Um, I, I don't know, they, I, I would assume they also use their stingers um, against animals who might try and get into their hives, but, um, but that's just my guess. I don't know, any, any, anybody else have a intimate knowledge of, uh, of these insects? I'll open it up. Nope. Right. I'll try and look into the history a little bit, see if I can right. find out the details. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on to the next step? Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So let's start uh, for uh, talking about venom immunotherapy um, with the history. So just a little bit of history. Um, in 1925, the first publication came out describing a case of immunotherapy for venom allergy. Uh, Braun reported desensitization of, of one patient uh, sensitive to bee stings. And this was using a whole body extract for treatment. Uh, the whole use of whole body extracts for desensitization gained popularity at this time. And it was about 50 years later that the first randomized controlled study using whole venom extracted from the venom sac was published. And this really was a pivotal study that showed the high effectiveness of the whole venom extract and uh, very little effectiveness above placebo for the whole body extract. So practices really began shifting away from the whole body preparation um, in lieu of the whole venom extract. Um, it was about 20 years later that the first practice parameters for immunotherapy uh, was published. And really the primary focus of the practice parameters uh, has been to provide a, a comprehensive framework for the management of a stinging insect hypersensitivity. The authors make a, a, a strong effort to incorporate data-driven recommendations and those based on expert consensus. Um, ultimately, the goal is really to improve patient care. And it's, it's a great reference, especially for those getting started um, with venom immunotherapy. The most recent update to the practice parameters came in 2017, um, and the authors acknowledge in that 2017 update that it, it contains guidance that differs from the FDA-approved package inserts, and that's really just because our experience with and understanding of the practice has evolved, um, and there's more published evidence out there to base those clinical guidance. Um, I'll try and point out these differences uh, as we go through the presentation. And then the other, um, just other interesting fact is up until 2017, there were two FDA approved suppliers of venom allergy products in the US market, uh, ALK Abeo and Hollister Steer. However, ALK left the US market in 2017. So since that time, Hollister Steer has been the sole supplier of these products to North America. Um, and you know, over the last few years, we have made significant um, updates and improvements in our manufacturing process um, and our, our capacity uh, to make sure that we can supply the entire market. <clears throat> so a, a quick disclaimer before we get into diagnosis and immunotherapy practices. Um, I do have a background in chemistry and biochemistry, but I am not a trained medical professional. Uh, the information that I present here is based on the package inserts, uh, the practice parameters, and peer-reviewed literature that's available. <clears throat> because of the high risk and of serious or life-threatening side effects um, like anaphylactic reactions. All the Hymenopter venom products have a black box or a boxed warning section in the package insert. And the intent is to just call attention to the potentially serious uh, risks um, when you use that product. 
um, in general, the practice is safe, but but um, there is there is always um, some risk. And ultimately, you know, diagnostic and therapeutic decisions are um, are a, a matter of uh, physician discretion and really should be considered in the context of each individual patient. So I will give you a, the um, how how the practice is, is typically executed, but there's there's variability um, like with any other medical practice. So this slide uh, shows an overview of the diagnostic process for venom allergy, and we'll go through each step in more detail. Uh, the, the overall process includes, of course, taking a patient history, uh, doing some testing, and then making a recommendation for treatment. Um, the diagnostic testing process is fairly time intensive. Uh, in total, it takes about three to four hours to complete. And it requires um, staff support as well as a physical space to closely monitor these patients, you know, as well as a willingness uh, from the patient uh, to undergo three or four hours of, of testing and evaluation. So the diagnostic process starts with a very thorough clinical history and exam. Uh, the intent is to really gather as many details about the history of any uh, reaction to insect stings. And this includes a thorough review of symptoms, were they local? Were they systemic? Uh, were they mild or moderate? Or were they severe? Is there a history of other reactions? Uh, what was the treatment? Was it administered by the person themselves or did they, or another non-medical professional? Did it require epinephrine? Did it require a call to the 911 or a visit to the emergency department? Um, what is the sting history? How often has this person been stung and had a serious reaction? And then of course you wanna assess other potential risk factors that may contribute to your decision to test or treat the patient. What medications are they taking? What other disease states are a factor? Is there cardiovascular risk? And these all factor in um, to how you move forward. It can be helpful to try and identify the insect causing the reaction. Um, we can look at situational clues to help ID the insect. Where on the body did they get stung? Um, where were they? What were they doing when they were stung? Did they get a look at what the offending insect was? However, it is important to keep in mind uh, that patient reports um, of the specific insect can be very unreliable. And you have to keep that in mind um, as you go forward with, uh, with testing. <clears throat> now, insect stings uh, can trigger a whole range of immune and clinical responses. Uh, this diagram shows the progression uh, from mild to moderate, uh, to uh, very severe and life-threatening reactions from venom stings. Uh, most insect stings are associated uh, with normal, transient, local cutaneous reactions characterized by pain, swelling, redness uh, at the sting site. Symptoms typically present immediately after the sting and resolve within a few hours for some patients, sometimes days. Um, and treatment measures are typically easy to manage. Ice packs, cortisone, hydrocortisone cream, Anti, or oral antihistamines um, and over-the-counter pain medications. And then uh, we can progress to a large local reaction. And while there's no universal definition, the reaction is typically characterized by a contiguous um, around the sting site and may involve part or all of the extremity. Uh, there's often a large area of warmth, redness, and swelling. It may develop um, anywhere from one to three days after the sting and, and can persist for up to about five days. Uh, large local reactions represent a late phase IgE-associated inflammatory response to these allergens. Um, the prevalence of lo large local reactions in, in the general population is approximately 10%, higher among beekeepers, those who work with the insects. Um, patients with a history of large local reactions have an approximate 7% chance of a systemic reaction to future stings. Um, that's for adults and children. Um, and then the next uh, more serious uh, response would be a systemic allergic reaction up to a severe anaphylact anaphylaxis. Excuse me. This typically occurs within about 30 minutes of the sting, but it can be delayed. Um, it may present with a variety of symptoms that involve multiple organs. Uh, systemic cutaneous reactions usually present as uh, paritis, flushing, urticaria, angioedema. Respiratory symptoms at present are typically stridor or wheezing. 
There could be gastrointestinal symptoms, including abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And cardiovascular symptoms are usually related to hypotension, lightheadedness, syncope, cardiovascular shock. Um, it's important and, and sometimes a challenge to differentiate these symptoms from toxicity or an anxiety reaction. And so keep that in mind as well um, as you go through your workup. Uh, the prevalence of uh, systemic reactions typically range from about 0.5 to 3.3% in the United States and are lower in children. Um, and like I said before, of those people who experience a systemic reaction from an insect sting, somewhere between 30 and 65% will have an anaphylactic reaction if stung again. Um, and the, the risk increases in those with a history of a life-threatening um, anaphylaxis from a previous sting. <clears throat> so if clinical history is consistent with an indication for venom allergy, the next step is to confirm the presence of venom-specific IgE antibodies, uh, typically with skin testing. Um, for skin testing, you prepare specific test solutions. I mean, it's important to include all five of the commercially available venom extracts. So again, the honeybee, the yellow jacket, the white-faced hornet, the yellow hornet, and the wasp venom. And for each, you'll need to prepare a series, typically five to six, 10-fold dilutions. And you want to include a positive and a negative control, uh, the positive control being histamine. The next slide shows uh, a schematic of the dilution preparation. Uh, it requires uh, a diluent and sterile empty vials. Uh, the diluent is sterile albumin saline with phenol, which uh, we call ABS. Uh, that enhances the stability of the diluted extracts. Um, this shows specifically the preparation of six tenfold dilutions. Um, and it's important to remember that these dilutions uh, need to be made aseptically to prevent contamination. Um, and just very quickly, uh, you reconstitute your, uh, your venom product, your lyophilized venom product with the amount uh, indicated on the package insert. That brings it to a concentration of 100 uh, micrograms per milliliter of protein. You, use, you distribute your ABS um, into the uh, pr preparation vials. Um, in, in this case, an example is 1.8 milliliters. Um, after this is reconstituted, you, you pull up 0.2 microliters and transfer it in, into your dilution vial. And that's a tenfold dilution. So that takes it down to 10 micrograms per milliliter of venom protein. And you can continue those serial dilutions until you have all vials prepared. And, and just a, a point of note, uh, they do have different um, expiration um, depending on um, the dilution. And so often these lower concentrations will need to be prepared uh, more often if, you, if you're using them um, over a longer period because they have a shorter expiration. And of course, this process is repeated with all five venom types. So you'll do this for, for each of the five. This slide shows a schematic of the testing process and it incorporates both a skin prick test and an intradermal test. And this is just one example. Again, like I said, practice can vary. Um, for skin prick testing, typically one drop of a one milligram per mil, one microgram, excuse me, per milliliter extract is placed on the skin. The site is pricked and you look for the skin response um, after about 15 to 20 minutes. In general, the criterion for a positive reaction is a wheel size of three millimeters uh, or, more, or, or greater than the control. Uh, but alternative criteria are used um, and recommended in the package insert. So if the test is positive, you stop. The positive reaction indicates uh, presence of IgE antibodies. Um, and again, make sure you do this for all five of the venoms. Um, if the skin test is negative for any of the venoms, uh, then you want to move to an intradermal test, which is denoted as IDT here, uh, which is more sensitive. So the first intradermal test will use one of the more dilute extracts, uh, typically 0 0.001 micrograms per milliliter concentration. However, if there's evidence that the patient might be highly sensitive, you can start with a lower dose um, if you wanna have a more conservative approach. So you inject for um, intradermal testing uh, a sufficient volume of the extract to produce a three millimeter bleb 
which is generally about 0.02 to 0.05 milliliters. Again, wait 20 minutes and assess the skin reaction. If it's positive, then you stop because there's indication of the presence of IgE antibodies. If it's negative, you can then progress to an intradermal test with an extract that's tenfold more concentrated. You wanna wait about 20 minutes between injections um, and you continue this process um, either until you get a positive reaction or until you reach one microgram per milliliter um, of the uh, venom concentrate. And again, this is just one example of the diagnostic scheme. There are several other meds, methods that have been described, including um, a one-step method using that a higher concentration, that 0.1 microgram per mil. But in the interest of time, we're not gonna cover all, all variations here today. So I'm gonna, just a, a quick recap. Um, a positive skin test response at a concentration less than or equal to one microgram per milliliter indicates the presence of specific IgE antibodies. There can be false positive results um, that are caused by nonspecific response that have been reported for concentrations greater than one microgram per milliliter. Um, and, and regarding safety, systemic reactions to venom skin testing are quite rare um, and they may be more frequent and are no more frequent with those accelerated methods. The process is generally regarded as safe, um, but it's always important to pre be prepared in your clinic for a negative outcome. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the um, updated practice parameters recommendations don't always align with the package insert. Um, this table shows a couple of those differences and, and we'll just touch on a few. Um, while the package insert calls for prick testing at concentrations of one microgram per milliliter, before intradermal testing, the practice parameters um, indicate that prick testing is optional and uses a higher concentration extract. Um, the starting intradermal concentration is typically a, a bit more conservative in the package insert than the practice parameters. Um, and then there are also differences uh, with the recommended wheel size cutoff to define a positive reaction. The, the package insert indicates uh, 10 to five to 10 millimeters while the practice parameters uh, indicate three to five millimeters. Okay, so let's talk quickly. There are some other tests that can be used to aid in the diagnostic assessment. And we'll just touch on these briefly. We're not gonna go into a, a lot of detail. Uh, first, venom specific serum IgE in vitro tests. So while skin tests are the preferred method, IgE blood tests can be used as a complementary or sometimes alternative test. Uh, for example, they can be used for those who can't undergo skin testing, um, either because of a severe skin disease um, or dermatographism. Uh, it may be helpful if skin tests are negative, but there's still strong evidence or suspicion of an IgE-mediated hypersensitivity. There are a small percentage of patients, maybe 10%, that will have a positive IgE blood test, but have a negative skin test. Um, we'll talk quickly about the basophil serum tryptase uh, measurements. Levels have been found to be increased in some patients with insect sting allergy. Um, the likelihood of an elevated basophil serum tryptase level is higher, and therefore the test, they're more useful in patients with severe reactions to stings. Uh, particularly those um, where there's hypotension in the absence of um, urticaria, and those that may have no detectable venom IgE on both skin and serum test. Um, basophil activation test may be useful in some cases, such as uh, patients with mastocytosis. There, is, there are some that believe it can be helpful in determining venom immunotherapy effectiveness. However, until some of the technical issues with the methodology have been resolved and there's more data to support its use, routine use um, is not recommended at this time, um, according to the practice parameters. And component resolved testing. So it is of interest to determine whether uh, in component testing, that is using recombinant venom allergies, uh, could be better for diagnosis uh, compared to a whole venom extract. Uh, either in terms of sensitivity or specificity. 
Um, studies are underway mostly in Europe. Um, we would need to study uh, those the US relevant species. And just a, from a manufacturer's perspective, um, you know, this is of interest, but there is considerable investment costs for development um, for non-clinical and clinical studies that would be required in order to bring such a product to the market because it would be a new product uh, differentiated from our, our whole extract uh, products that we currently have. <clears throat> okay, so once we have a complete clinical history and we've done skin testing to confirm the presence of IgE antibodies, you can make a recommendation to your patients regarding the next course of action. Uh, patient education is really critical at this point, um, both when discussing the diagnostic test results and then options to continue with immunotherapy. Uh, basic treatment is avoidance and a prescription for emergency medications such as uh, epinephrine autoinjector. However, I think we need to acknowledge that, that both do have limitations. Avoidance can't be guaranteed. Um, and less than 30% of patients with a known severe allergy to insect stings carry their epinephrine auto-injector at all times, and only 44% of patients who carry their epinephrine auto-injector for a stinging insect allergy uh, demonstrate proper administration of the device. Um, so it's not a foolproof uh, treatment uh, uh, path. So when is venom immunotherapy, or VIT, VIT, indicated? So venom immunotherapy is indicated for those that have a systemic reaction beyond a cutaneous, and for those which have a confirmed specific Ig antibody to venom, who test positive in that venom skin test. Um, it's especially helpful for those with the most severe anaphylactic reactions, those involving cardiac and respiratory systems, um, those with, that are potentially life-threatening. Those are the patients that are more likely to have a severe reaction in the future. On the other hand, venom immunotherapy is not indicated uh, for those with no history of reaction um, or only a local cutaneous reaction. Uh, venom immunotherapy is generally not required for patients who have experienced a large local reaction to sting. However, it can be considered for those who have frequent and unavoidable exposure. Um, it's not indicated if skin test is negative. So in cases where you cannot confirm specific IgE antibodies, or simply if the patient is concerned because there seems to be a family history of reaction, um, that, that is not grounds uh, to continue for, to venom immunotherapy. So of course, every patient is different. Their particular situation should always be taken into account when recommending venom immunotherapy. Um, you should always uh, present the potential benefits as well as the potential risk associated with immunotherapy and make sure those are clear to the patient. Um, and then candidates for immunotherapy should be given documented informed consent that can be included in their medical records. Um, and, and it should be clearly documented which venoms uh, they appear to be allergic to, especially if patients uh, change physicians, that information can be very helpful uh, to have clearly documented in their medical history. Okay, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. These are just some suggestions for avoidance. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory. Um, so I did talk about communicating the potential benefits for venom immunotherapy. Efficacy is strong for both Vespids and honeybee venoms. It's greater than 95% and 85% respectively. Venom immunotherapy reduces the risk and severity of subsequent sting reactions. And if there is a subsequent systemic reaction, they're generally mild, milder than the pre-venom immunotherapy sting reaction. Uh, this can really alleviate some of the patient's anxiety and in general improve quality of life, especially for parents um, who have kids of, uh, that are hypersensitive to uh, venom stings. But like any other type of allergy immunotherapy, there are also potential risks associated with venom immunotherapy. Um, anaphylaxis risk is more fre frequent in honeybee venom allergic uh, patients, um, especially those with more severe uh, previous reactions or those with the elevated basophil serum tryptase levels or mastocytosis. Large local reactions um, can happen, but they're generally tolerated. And serum sickness-like reactions have been reported, but in most cases, the symptoms subsided and patients could continue 
uh, to their maintenance dose. And then regarding pregnancy, um, there really is a lack of data on venom immunotherapy during pregnancy. So the risk benefit ratio needs to be considered for each situation. Um, consider the severity of past reactions and ability to avoid exposure. Um, in general, you want to avoid beginning venom immunotherapy or, or executing that buildup phase during pregnancy because of a higher risk of systemic reactions. Um, and then in general, it's also safe to continue maintenance dose um, during pregnancy. So this slide shows an overview of the process for venom allergy immunotherapy, and we'll go through again each step in more detail. Uh, the overall process does require a significant commitment from the patient. Uh, venom immunotherapy takes a minimum of about three years, but may go on indefinitely. Um, so patients need to be very, we need to be very clear with your patients about this before they start. Um, venom immunotherapy starts with the buildup phase. And so this is taking the patient from a very small dose um, up to a target maintenance dose. It is important to include all the venoms uh, for which the patient tested positive and demonstrated specific IgE. The buildup phase typically begins with a dose of up to one microgram of venom protein. And the goal is really to increase it to a target of 100 micrograms. There are several buildup schedules that can be used, uh, which are, are shown in the table here. And you wanna choose a buildup dose schedule that works both for you um, in your practice as well as the patient. So a conventional buildup um, will achieve the maintenance dose in approximately four to five months by giving one injection a week. Uh, the starting dose, again, can be tailored to the patient. So considering their sensitivity and comfort level, a conventional slash semi-rush schedule will get the patient to a target maintenance in about two months by giving two to three injections per week. Uh, a rush uh, schedule requires a pretty intense treatment over a short period um, in terms of days. Uh, for example, uh, you can give up to 10 doses in a given day one, followed by three doses on day two and a final dose to get to that maintenance um, concentration on day three. Um, rush schedule is more frequently used in situations where patients don't have immediate access to a specialist for treatment um, or when there might be an urgent need for protection. Um, an ultra rush, rush schedule um, condenses the maturity of the buildup um, into that first day and then um, gives uh, weekly injections uh, to uh, obtain the maintenance dose. Um, and just a quick note on safety, the practice parameters indicate that the risk of systemic reactions uh, during the buildup phase is similar for a conventional and the rush regimens, the, the uh, three, two to five day rush regimens, but maybe slightly greater using that ultra rush uh, regimen where uh, the majority of the doses um, and you're building up a lot faster. These are two examples of a conventional and a semi-rush dosing schedule. And these are included in the most recent practice parameters. So we're not gonna go into detail, but these are really great reference for practices getting started with venom immunotherapy. And it really steps you through um, what, the, what the, both the concentration of extract that you're using and then the injection volume are um, to reach your, your, your maintenance uh, target dose. Schedule one is based on the package insert from Hollister Steer venom extracts. And again, the injections are weekly. Uh, schedule two was based on the package insert for ALK extracts, um, which are no longer available. But again, this um, is that semi-rush that uh, treats with two to three injections a week um, for about eight weeks. These are example of a, the rush and the ultra rush buildup um, schedules. Uh, and again, these are just great references um, and, and practical practical guidance uh, to get started in the business. So once you get through the buildup phase, um, you've, and you've achieved a target maintenance dose of 100 micrograms, um, immunothe immunotherapy uh, should continue for several years. Uh, for the first 12 to 18 months of maintenance dosing, injections uh, will be monthly. The frequency can be reduced to about every six to eight weeks after about a year and a half and up to about four years. And then the frequency can be further reduced to every 12 weeks after about four years of immunotherapy. 
So what about termination? When can you end venom immunotherapy? Uh, really the decision to stop venom immunotherapy depends on the patient and their situation. In general, three to five years is, is generally sufficient, but for some patients, especially those with high risk factors, venom immunotherapy should go on indefinitely. Um, unfortunately, there's no one specific test to predict relapse after venom immu immunotherapy has stopped. Um, you really need to consider several of the factors. Um, how severe was the initial reaction? How um, frequent is exposure? What is the presence of any concomitant disease and, and medication that might affect uh, the patient? Um, how does it affect uh, you know, the work and leisure activities of the patient? What's the patient's preference? Um, and some are starting to use, like I said, the basophil serum tryptase levels to in help inform this decision. And the other point is whether or not they continue with immunotherapy, it's, it's always uh, a good practice to continue carrying the epinephrine auto-injector, uh, especially based on uh, any higher risk factors that the patient might have. Shannon, there was a time when uh, it was recommended you could measure uh, the development of IgG anti-venom or a ratio of IgG to IgE. Um, I don't think that's done anymore. I don't know if your company even offers the IgG test. Where does that stand? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, no, our company does not offer the IgE test. And I, I don't know... I have not heard that is commonly used anymore, um, but it would be interesting to talk to, you know, uh, some of some of the folks who have been in this business for quite some time, um, and, and to see if that is something that is still used. Um, and I don't know if anybody on the call um, has any additional information. I know insurance doesn't pay for it. I, I don't yeah. think it's being done. Yeah. The other thing that always comes up about termination is the last that I recall, there were studies that showed even after five years of continuous venom immunotherapy, when you took people off, that their risk gradually climbed back up to about 15 to 17 yeah. percent. So they, they did remain different than the general population who never had a reaction in the first place. And for some people, I always felt that might be a reason to even continue beyond five years. I don't know if anybody's ever come back to study that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know of any. I, I do know that it's, um, you know, if a patient is willing to do it, especially when you can spread it out to about 12 weeks, that's what four visits a year. So it's not as onerous as perhaps when you were doing a monthly injection were required. Um, and so if a patient is willing, it's probably the safest um, approach. I think studies are challenging because, um, you know, they're, they're long studies to do. Um, and to do a really good controlled study um, can be a challenge in, in those patients. But I will, I, I noted that down. I'm, I'll, I'll look for any um, recent evidence um, that, that would give us more indication of, of what that termination options might be. I think in practice, that's exactly right. If you can tell people it's four injections for a year to maintain your protection, at least in my experience, a great number go well beyond five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know, uh, the other interesting thing to me is um, I know people used to do more sting challenges I don't know if people do that anymore, um, and and maybe maybe you have a sense of that. Do do I don't think they were ever done in clinical practice. Yeah. That, that was research studies, and in fact, interesting. I did comment earlier, but you you didn't make much of a point about whole body extract versus venom. Um, you just discussed it as if it was established that whole body extracts didn't work. There was actually a tremendous fight. There were a lot of people yeah. decades ago who were very committed to whole body and didn't want the FDA to take the product off the market. Mm -hmm. And it took that classic study by the Liechtenstein group at Hopkins, mm -hmm. where they put people in the ICU and yeah. stung them and yeah. gave them anaphylaxis and showed that whole body extract was no better than placebo yeah. um, to finally nail the uh, put the nail in the coffin of whole body extract being ineffective and removing it from the marketplace. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I did. Yes. And I, I acknowledge that I, it would be really interesting to really dive into that study. Um, if you can, you should go back and take a look at it because, you know, it's one of those studies that would be really hard to do today. Um, mm -hmm. Not sure an IRB would have approve it because because of like you said what they did um uh, with um seeing people and, and inducing an anaphylactic reaction but it is an interesting um and and people do get very sort of attached to their method um and obviously that happens throughout the course of um and in many fields um and so yes i did kind of gloss over some of those details um but that that would be a fun topic to look back on so um, I'm going to just quickly continue and then um, we'll move on to venom allergy manufacturing. I, I just want to point out again that there are some differences between the recommendations in the most recent practice parameters versus the uh, product package insert. And just a couple of points. Um, the package insert recommends the same maintenance dose for both adults and children. The practice parameters do indicate that the target dose for children um, may be effective at 50 micrograms instead of 100 micrograms. Um, the practice parameters also make recommendations for increased intervals that we talked about, um, especially the further into venom immunotherapy one gets. Um, the package insert keeps it at four weeks. However, the, pack, the practice parameters, again, spreads it out up to about 12 weeks um, after your several in, years into immunotherapy. Um, and then the practice parameters also incorporates alternatives, um, like I said, for this um, indefinite uh, duration. And then there is some guidance um, on who will benefit from venom immunotherapy, uh, depending on their specific uh, situation. Um, so again, I refer you to the practice parameters uh, to really get those details. And with the few minutes uh, that we have left, I really want to cover um, how our products are made. So currently uh, products for venom diagnostic and, and therapeutics come in a couple different presentations. There's a five dose vial and a 12 dose vial. Um, and as discussed earlier, they're available for five of the common offenders. Um, plus there's a mixed Vespid presentation that includes both the yellow jackets um, and, and the hornets, uh, both of the hornets. These products are freezed dried venom so that when reconstituted with the appropriate volume, they yield that 100 micrograms per milliliter extract or a 300 microgram extract for the mixed Vespid. The manufacturing process starts with the preparation of the raw materials and the process for the Vespid raw material production is illustrated in this slide. Um, allergen manufacturers rely on an approved network of uh, nationwide collectors Whole insects are received frozen and they're inspected uh, to ensure that they're correctly identified and they meet certain uh, criteria for extraneous material. Uh, the process really begins with the dissection of the insects. Um, each venom sac of every individual insect is dissected and placed in a cold extraction fluid. Um, and this is a very manual process. It takes up to about 130,000 insects per batch and it can be up to about 520 hours of dissection, dissection for one batch, and that's you know, for those smaller insects. Um, once dissection is complete, the venom sacs in solution are ho homogenized to break them open so that the proteins are extracted in the fluid. Uh, that extract is then clarified to remove the gross matter, it is then sterile filtered and filled into bulk vials and lyophilized and that is our processed material. There are quality control or QC testing points uh, throughout this process to ensure that it meets its predetermined specifications. Um, this is a, uh, a picture, um, pictures of the uh, venom dissection process. And I do have just a quick 30 second video that shows you how this is done. And it, it's quite interesting, I think. So this is our technician. They pull out the stinger and there's that tiny venom sac at the end that they recover from each insect.
And so, like I said, it's, it's a very manual process, um, uh, but it, it, it is fascinating to watch. And then I just wanna highlight that, that that process was for the Vespid insects. The process for collecting honeybee venom is different. Um, the, the vendors set up a mild electrical current um, across electrostimulation grid that's set up at the hive entrance. And this causes the bee to involuntarily sting downward and thus depositing a drop of pure venom on that glass slide. Uh, the bee is unharmed um, and the venom is allowed to air dry. And those resulting crystals are what are scraped off and then sold to the venom manufacturers as a component or one of the ingredients. Uh, this is not done in house. The next step of the process is the manufacture of the finished product. Um, equipment and components, including a mannitol solution are prepared. That bulk formulation, the lyophilized uh, Vespid raw material or the honeybee crystals that um, are dissolved then in a cold mannitol solution. And at this point, uh, we do a protein test to confirm that we've hit the target protein concentration. If the bulk solution is too high in protein content, it can be diluted. If it is uh, lower, protein content than we desire, then it can be fortified. Once the protein concentration is confirmed, uh, the bulk solution is sterile filtered, and then the sterile bulk solution is aseptically filled into the final container vials and lyophilized. After lyophilization and oversealing, uh, the final containers are 100% inspected for defects and um, conformance and are packaged um, and, and ready to go out to the customer. There are four QC or quality control test points uh, throughout this process. And as you probably know or may not know, uh, venom extracts are standardized, uh, which means that the FDA has established the test required to release each batch. And these requirements are the same for all manufacturers, although Hollister Steer is currently the only manufacturer um, selling product in the United States. Venom standardization is based on measurements of enzymatic activity, specifically hyaluronidase and phospholipase A are the two enzyme tests that are required by the FDA. And protein content is based on an approved Lowry method. That is how they're labeled, that 100 microgram per milliliter concentration. Manufacturers also test each batch for sterility, safety, moisture, mannitol con content, and appearance. And that's all for the United States requirements. There is also a European requirement used, uh, to compare the protein profiles uh, using SDS page for honeybee, yellow jacket, and wasp. Um, and for research purposes, we often uh, do additional tests uh, that aren't required for, for lot release. So that really sums up um, the manufacturing process. And then I'll just touch really quickly the last thing um, is to really touch on is the effort to increase general awareness for immunotherapy. And you know, there is such strong evidence that shows that venom immunotherapy is highly effective for those treated. However, there's often this lack of awareness, both just in the general public and by some medical professionals that immunotherapy is even an option. Um, and it's an option that can prevent anaphylaxis and possible death. So it's really critical to educate both groups, both the medical community and the general public on the benefits of venom immunotherapy. And really with the goal of increasing those referrals um, so that more candidates for immunotherapy can be tested and be identified. And if they meet the criteria, they can be helped by immunotherapy. So the Be Aware Allergy Program is a really good place to get more information. Um, it provides online information for patient education as well as a uh, physician locator. Um, and Hollister Steer can also provide patient educational materials for people's practices. Um, so definitely reach out if that's something that you're interested or if you just want more information on venom immunotherapy uh, in general. So I know we only have about five or six minutes. Um, so I will, one, tell you that the word of the day is marvel, um, and two, open it up for questions if anybody has any questions. Thank you, uh, Shannon. You know, looking at the dissection process, how a labor intensive it is. Has anybody just tried to compare uh, using either, you know, purified hyaluronidase, phospholipase, knowing what the primary uh, allergen is, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You could make that much more easily than dissecting these tiny insects. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, I think it's very similar to, you know, the interest in looking at recombinant allergens, those specific allergens. Um, and, and so there is interest in that. And, um, but like I said, the challenge from a manufacturing standpoint is it's a new product, right? It's not just a change of a raw material. So it's a new product. So it has to, you have to start from the beginning, do all your non-clinical studies, do your clinical efficacy studies. And so it's a, it's a fairly lengthy and time consuming and expensive process. And so as a manufacturing company, it, it, we, we have to weigh um, that investment um, and, and there's a risk to it, right? So I, I think it's an interesting uh, concept. Um, and I think it's worth exploring. Um, and, and maybe as we get um, some more information, um, you know, that, that's a path that we'll consider, but right now we're sticking with the whole venom um, extract product, um, at least for us anyway. Well, also having posed that question, mm -hmm. um, even though we may know the major allergen in each species, yeah. there are minor allergens. So when the same approach has been tried with mm -hmm. inhalant uh, immunotherapy, usually the crude product is more eff efficacious than trying to use a single allergen. Yeah. Uh, there's a long history of that with ragweed yeah. uh, immunotherapy. Yeah, and, and it, you know, there's always that risk of, our, our, you know, how many patients might you miss? And so there's, there's, there would be considerable work showing um, that you can reach, you know, certainly a high majority of patients if you went to a single allergen versus um, a, a whole profile of allergens. Absolutely. Any other questions from our audience out there? We've got nearly 40 people listening to you. If you do think of questions, um, you know, after this presentation, by all means, uh, reach out to me or, or any of my colleagues and uh, we'd be happy uh, to talk venom, venom allergy uh, with you. Why is it that we use whole body extract for fire ant and we use specific venom for the uh, others? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think it has to do more with the difficulty of getting the venom out of fire ants. Um, then it's, you know, we can, we can identify and pull that venom sack out of, 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 of the hornets and, and yellow jackets, but I think it's much more difficult. Um, I, I know that, um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, Derek Constable, he'd been with our company for you know, almost 40 years. Um, and, and he tried to look into some options of how, how we could extract the venom from those fire ants uh, without doing a whole body extraction. But um, there definitely were challenges with the collection process. So did your company make the fire ant product? We do have fire ant, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, one other thing that's always fascinated me, why do we extend venom immunotherapy to every three months and no one has ever investigated uh, environmental allergy no. beyond one month? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really good question. I think it's just, um, it, it may be people's personal interest. Um, and so they spend the time and energy and money um, on those studies. Um, it, it certainly, again, you know, would be a good thing to look at. Um, you know, and if, if, any, if any clinics are interested in doing such a study, um, you know, certainly reach out and, and maybe there's a way to partner, um, you know, in, in, in doing some of that. All right, any other questions before we wrap this up? Or right, thank you for getting up early and giving us this, this presentation. Absolutely, I, I really appreciate everybody's time um, this morning. You have a great day and uh, maybe we'll see you again next year. You, do you still have our fellows come over to your manufacturing plant um, and, and view the pro these processes? Yeah, you know, we are absolutely open to that. Um, right now, because of the COVID, COVID yeah. we're really not bringing um, people into the company because we're really trying to isolate the essential workers um, that are 
that are producing the drugs. Um, but I have to believe that someday we're going to get past this. Um, and then at that time, absolutely, we would always entertain um, uh, folks coming over and taking a look at the manufacturing process, um, and just visiting and seeing the facility. All right, so long. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Have a good day.